hold your gas. In <laughs> well, we'll try this this afternoon here, and if the rain runs us out, the rain runs us out after all. Uh, is there anything anybody's burning to say that's accumulated while we're settling? I've got a quick one. Uh, can you overdose on DMT? No, probably not if you're self-administering and smoking, because I think it would simply, you would be unable to get yourself together enough to get the pipe and the match and everything coordinated. I've seen people who thought they had overdosed, but they just got a full dose. I don't know what an overdose would look like. The LD50 is, I don't know if it's ever been determined anyway, it's very high. Um, people have asked me if it's dangerous, and I think the answer to that is probably only if you fear death by astonishment. <laughs> But, you know, this is a possibility, uh, and so, you know, you may laugh now, but if it planted you, you'd be real amazed as you went out, right? <coughs> oh my God, it's killing me! I'm so amazed! Have any of the plant sources matched the smoke? Of DMT? Well... If you, may, if you make ayahuasca and you make it very, very strong and then you sit in silent darkness and you work with your breath and you really have a load on, after about an hour or an hour and 20 minutes, you can actually reach a place where you look around and say, it looks like a DMT flash is going on, folks. So, but it's very... the Part of what makes DMT so shocking is the speed with which it happens. And that in itself lends to the psychedelic nature of it because it's like being struck by lightning or something. I mean, some people, when you give it to them, they don't even... they don't think that they did the substance. They think that they were about to do the substance and then were struck by lightning or something. So people sometimes come out of it demanding to know what happened. They said, well, what happened? They said, well, you did it. They said, that's it? That's what it is? They said, yes. And they said, oh, I thought that a fighter plane fell into the apartment house. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. I've got something I'd like to get out. Sure. Uh, I had an experience one time with DMT. I'd like to know if you had a similar experience. Uh, I had an experience one time with DMT. I don't know if parents had any experiences similar, which is as I was comfortably sitting down against the wall in the afterglow, the still things that uh, are going on, is that the whole field of activity, which was an experience, just parted like a movie screen. And there was just absolutely nothing but a very soft, light, light, yellow light behind that. But this fairly blew me away. Did you have any this was, before? you were coming down, yeah. and then suddenly there was this sense of the visual field splitting and something lying behind yeah, it. Yeah, it just, it drew apart like a curtain. I never had exactly that. I remember I had a very anomalous DMT trip once. I, it was sort of like that. It was Here's what it was. It was really a strange one. I can't remember where I was. But anyway, I smoked the DMT and I expected to see the chrysanthemum and everything as I describe. And instead, when I opened my eyes, or when I, not when I opened my eyes, but when I broke through into the space, I seem to see red flocked wallpaper in a fleur de lis on a wall of some sort. It looked like red flocked wallpaper. And as I looked at this, I dropped my head forward and there was a, a water fountain spigot of the kind that you depress and it shoots a stream of water coming out of a marble basin. And it was just perfectly realistic. And then above it, and then I saw above it, was this flocked red wallpaper. 
And as I was trying to get my bearings in this situation, I turned like 90 degrees and there was a curtain of red velvet. And I walked <coughs> through the curtain and there was a DMT trip up on a huge cinemascope screen. And I just sat down in the aisle seat, and then the trip happened. <laughs> but, but there had been this peculiar hesitation where I was apparently in some Art Deco movie palace somewhere on the foyer landing at the water fountain. And then, and I never quite understood what that was about or why it happened but it had the same quality of the parting curtain revealing the trip somehow already in progress one of the things that goes on in DMT that's sort of <coughs> odd is you perceive your body geometry differently you seem to have um, an infantile body you can tell that your head is massive and your body is small and your arms and legs are short. And at times we've played around with the idea that once you smoke DMT, all subsequent trips are like journeys back to this first trip. It's as though you can, you open a nexus in time in your personality. And then every subsequent trip, you just return to this to this open place. There's a very funny feeling about it that is something about the past, something about time. It's hard to put your finger on. I remember one time, I mean, this is more explicit, but these are the more anomalous trips. I remember once, about, it must have been 25 years ago, a long time ago, I smoked DMT with these two women both of which I had had a relationship with in the past. And I was living with one of them at the time, and we smoked the DMT together, and and I opened my eyes at one point. And one of these women was just aging furiously. I mean, her hair was turning white, her teeth were turning in her mouth, her skin was melting, and, and it was it was absolutely startling and the other one was getting younger at an equal rate going you know 25 21 17 16 4 and it was like it was not it didn't feel like it was about my relationship to them or what i thought about a over b it looked more profound than that. I mean, it looked like one of them was going forward in time and one of them was going backward in time, and it was right in front of me. And I didn't say anything. I was too <coughs> shocked. I didn't know what in the world you could say. I just gaped at this spectacle uh, and then closed my eyes and went off into something else. Uh, also, do you feel that there's a relationship between practice and DMT experience? Well, fractals and DMT, in trying to account for these little creatures, I've entertained many different kinds of theories. And one theory, which is I call the fractal personality theory, is, you know, if you had a mirror and you were to, and you were sitting on a concrete floor, and you were to bring the mirror down and shatter it in front of yourself, you would not see a shattered reflection of yourself. You would see hundreds of little whole reflections of yourself. It would be as though you had literally blown your personality to smithereens. And Jung talks about, in, in Mysterium Cinunctiones, which is definitely his best book, I recommend it for everybody psychedelic, he talks about what are called kibiri, 
the alchemical elves that appear in the final stage of the alchemical opus and are the helping elementals that bring the alchemical opus to conclusion. And he has this wonderful passage where he's trying to be the scientist, but he's also trying to be true to this completely freaky phenomenon that he's talking about. And he says something like... Uh, Autonomous fragments of the psyche, having escaped from the reigning control of the ego, dance and cavort around the startled artifacts. You think, you know, what was the Mysterium Conjunctiones. It's subtitled A Study of the Union of Opposites in Alchemy. What was that second word? Huh? What was that Mysterium Conjunctiones, C-O-N-J-U-N-C-T-I-O-N-I-U-S, or something like that. Uh, so it's possible to imagine that what happens on DMT is you literally, you know, here's one way to dissolve the ego, you blow it apart. <laughs> and like mercury, or that's another good metaphor, like smashing a flask of mercury on the floor in front of you, the stuff of the <clears> psyche, <throat> The fluid metal of the self sends back then a thousand reflections, and they all are distorted reflections as they would be, and they all are peculiarly familiar, hauntingly familiar, because guess who it is? It's your good old self, but in some put through some filter, some distorting lens of transformation that uh, gives you the impression that you know a swarm. You're now encountering a swarm of alien, uh, insectoid, machine, elf, toy, cyborg viruses, or something like that. What could have been the question? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, got it, got it. If you think of normal neurotransmitters as having a rhythm moving in, moving out of a receptor, you know, kind of a stable rhythm, and then these slightly off chemicals just throw the rhythm off. And it's like instead of a mirror facing each other and you just get a standing wave with the two mirrors, they spread a little bit, and then you go, all of a sudden you get a kaleidoscope. Yes, I mean, this is a reasonable, uh, this is a weirdly halfway materialistic, halfway Jungian explanation of what is happening. It doesn't quite cover it. I mean, when you're there and they're <laughs> dancing around you, it's seen to be totally inadequate as an explanation. But as we sit here, presumptuous to the extreme, it seems reasonable, you know, and possible. Anything else anybody wants to talk about before I... Yeah. What do you think about enlightenment? You mean in the Buddhist sense of enlightenment? Well, this is sort of goes to this question which we've talked about in other... along other avenues of approach, which is the question, do psychedelics have anything to do with so-called spirituality? Uh, enlightenment... Well, there are different notions of what enlightenment is, first of all. I mean, there's a soft version, a kind of Protestant version, where people say, well, enlightenment is something which comes and goes from each of us many times a day. If we could but cling to it, we would know it. And it is, you know, our absent friend weaving in and out of ordinary experience. That's the soft version of enlightenment. But then, you know, there's a hard version of enlightenment which says if a single sentient being attains enlightenment for a single nanosecond anywhere in the kiliocosm of eternity, then all sentient beings will instantly be sucked into the presence of the paranirvana and the illusion of space and time will collapse and the tathagata will be eminent and so forth and so on. I sort of uh, like the hard version because uh, makes it easier to know when you're in the presence of it. Uh, it was, I don't know. I mean, this is an interesting question. 
you know, I suppose, and I mean, they do, an orthodox Buddhist of the hardcore sort, I think they're fairly contemptuous of psychedelicos, and what they would lay on us is that we are uh, uh, obsessed with sangsara, that our love of the 10,000 things will forever stand between us and union with the undescribable, unutterable Platinian non-entity outside of all realms of description and anticipation and so forth and so on. Probably true. It's just that, you know, buying into that that thing exists at all is a major step. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm willing to play the Pied Piper there. I'm interested in the 10,000 things. I mean, what thrills me are museums full of butterflies and libraries full of books and galleries full of paintings and parties full of women and just the multiplicity of things. And that's what psychedelics seem to celebrate. On the other hand, it's very hard to be a psychedelic person, I think, and not participate in one of the central tenets of both Buddhism and Hinduism, which is the primacy of mind, mind only, the dogma that, you know, all manifestation is somehow a product of the ratiocination of mind. That's a pretty, pretty Buddhist uh, point of view. I think you can secure, I think you can make progress spiritually with psychedelics, but not necessarily. Yeah, do. Yeah, um, with your leave, I. No, Sigan. Let me add something to that. I, I've been a practitioner of the uh, heart school um, for uh, some years now, and uh, that question actually of the relationship of. of uh, the two is a lot of why I'm here and what I've been thinking about and it's one of the reasons that I started to um, write the book that I'm working on. Um, actually, I think Terence's answer is uh, quite to the point about the 10,000 things. There is a certain, I would not say contemptuousness in traditional Japanese Zen for instance, uh, it's just mainly a, a lack of experience. There is, I think, a general misunderstanding of enlightenment from everything that I have learned in my years of study, and I'm not claiming to be enlightened, and I'm not a particularly good student, but I think in D.T. Suzuki's emphasis on Satori, um, People came to think of enlightenment as the end of the path. And it's actually more appropriate to think of enlightenment as then you can begin your path. It's kind of the prerequisite to begin your practice, um, which then continues from that point on. That's the Mahayana way. Um, before enlightenment, you're just kind of walking around stirring up the mud like everybody else. Um, maybe in psychedelics, uh, there is certainly a danger in a spiritual sense, uh, if that's why you're doing it, to um, become fascinated by phenomena uh, and miss the essential point. Um, but uh, certainly I have led a, dis a discussion in a group of hardcore Zen students, uh, many of whom advanced from beginning to teach themselves. Uh, and it was quite amazing that a large number of them openly said they were first led to it and open to the experiences through psychedelics. Um, I also kind of found it comforting that there were some of those who I assumed had done the same thing that had never taken any drugs whatsoever and said, what are you guys talking about? I understand all that, but I never took any drugs. 
But I think generally it's true that there would be not only no Zen, but no New Age, no this, no that. All of this really goes back. The people who have founded all these alternative therapies and schools and methods inevitably were Lodi's in the 60s. Uh, yeah. It just might be of interest the most recent issue of Gnosis magazine uh -huh. on the issue of psychedelics and yeah, I wasn't so keen on it. I mean, I didn't... <clears throat> it does have discussion on it, and it's rarely discussed. It should be discussed more, I think. Where psychedelics and the spiritual marketplace find themselves shoulder to shoulder, I think, is when you run up against the adherence of... Uh, uh, Shaivite yogas of various sorts, where there is definitely a stress on visionary phenomena, internal transformation of body states, magical powers, so forth and so on, and, uh, you know, there's qu quite a feeling of competitiveness. I studied some of those yogas. I certainly don't claim to be an expert my conclusions about Indian spirituality were largely unhappy ones. I mean, it seemed to me that the the shell of something was there, but that it had been for millennia uh, uh, counterfeited and adulterated and manipulated, and that it was that I can't imagine a longer path to spiritual breakthrough than the path that leads through. Uh, the ashrams and uh, and uh, so forth of of Mother India. Let me mention a, a couple of things. You mentioned uh, Shaivism, uh, and I have to say that I've been uh, fooling around with uh, Shiva worship in particular, and it's come because nobody else does it, so you don't have to worry about groups. Um, but anyway, it, I, I, that's something I've been studying. It does fall right into uh, different budget streams. But I think of if you think of your spiritual goal as the, the golden city you're trying to get to, and you're in the jungle, and you know where it is, if you drop this substance, it's like climbing a tree. You get up high, you can see it. You know what direction it is. And you may go back down and then walk there. You don't want to just keep climbing the tree to look at it. You want to keep walking. Well, I, now and then you still got to climb the tree to find a hole. Yeah, that's the metaphor that I find most useful and neutral for talking about psychedelics is the dimensional metaphor. In other words, when you say climb a tree, what you mean is gain a higher dimensional vantage point on the landscape of experience. And this is what the psychedelic does, and then what you do with that point of view is entirely up to you, yeah. I think I'm starting to view my, my journey as that the barometer for the usefulness of these experiences and what keeps drawing me on is how they come back into my life and our self uh, rewarding and how I view the relationships that I have with primarily with my family and my spouse and then those people that I come in contact with and whether or not those relationships seem to be more valuable and authentic, uh, more compassionate, more uh, uh, other understanding than they have in previous years. And, and that personal insight to the changes that are occurring in my life seem to be drawing me and as such are a reflection of what I understand spiritual growth to be about, to try to be here in a better way at the moment and the time and the place that I'm in. And, and so I have a personal perspective that the pollen of psychedelics in my life is helping me unfold in a way that I'm looking at the emerging flower and appreciating it greatly. And in that sense, it's highly spiritual. Well, it's a catalyst for the imagination. <coughs> and, the, and definitely the spiritual unfoldment is an act of imagination. There may be other 
things that are acts of imagination that aren't like that. I mean, like the designing of a building or the managing of a company. They also might profit from psychedelics. But for sure, I think if you have spiritual intent as a precondition, psychedelic use is just going to be very important to you. All the spiritual methods seem to work in the presence of psychedelics. The methods which, in my experience, largely don't work any other time. For example, yantra, mantra, chanting, visualization, uh, conjuration in some cases. All of these things which are very resistant to functioning in ordinary mental space work like a charm just over the line. So I imagine, you know, that why our religions are so pale and tepid and unsatisfying is we're like sitting around in fine automobiles, but nobody bothered to fill the gas tank. And so, you know, we play. We play the radio, and we turn on the windshield wipers and the blinkers, and but we don't go anywhere. And it's because what you need is spiritual technique, shamanic technique, religious practice in the presence of a boundary-dissolving pharmacological fuel. And then it really happens. And if you have the pharmacological fuel but not the spiritual intent, then what you become is a very, uh, is a philosopher of some sort, a Michael Tausig. I mean, I'm really interested in Michael Tausig. I've never met the guy, but when you read his book on ayahuasca, it's wonderful. <laughs> There's a, that's what makes horse races, you see. But I'm sure we would agree, whether we think the book is awful or wonderful, that there is not a spiritual bone in this man's body, not an atom of spirituality. And yet, he's taken as much ayahuasca as I or Sparrow or anybody here under the right conditions with the real people. And so then seeing what does it do to that kind of mind, uh, a mind without spiritual intent, is, is fascinating. In any case, I think you can't catalyze your imagination without becoming an exceptional person. You may become an exceptional bore. You may become exceptionally overbearing or exceptional at designing jet skis. But because it catalyzes the imagination, it propels you forth out of the ordinary. Yeah, what did you, you wanted to say? Though? For me, it seems a real simple way of looking at things to say the reason ordinary people aren't high, including you and me, a lot of the time is that our dream stuff is squandered. It's squandered in regrets about the past and uh, haftas about the future. And this ties in real well with the Buddhist idea of involvement with samsara. And for me, there's no conflict between the gamut of my psychedelic experiences and this idea, because like somebody said, talking about the cigarette last night, it, all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm right here right now. And uh, helping us collect that uh, part of our essence, which uh, has to do with dreaming into the present moment, is the same. I even have no problem with Christianity. Uh, well, I've tried to look at all the religions and see the, the good uh, without the bad uh, over the 20 years of use of psychedelics, but uh, being in the world but not of it, what a perfect uh, expression of the, the clear light and even of uh, flying in the hyperspectral matrix and yet still being here to enjoy things. Uh, just to be here without fear or craving seems to be the key to understanding religions and all of my psychedelic experiences as well. And the wild dreams and visions that we have can usually make sense in terms of dream language if you choose to look at them. Uh, but they might be having some kind of dialogue of that nature. Well, imagine how our relationship to each other and the world and the unconscious would change if somebody invented a drug 
the effect of which was you remembered your dreams. And if you took this drug at night before going to sleep, the next morning you would have total recall of your dreams. I dare say total recall of our dreams would lead to the discovery that every night you discover the secret that has never been told. You know, it can never be told. It is sealed away at the center of the mandala, at the center of the mandala. But in dreams, every night, I think, we touch the stone. We unravel the ultimate secrets of our origin and our destiny. But the, it's amazing how well sealed against memory that is. The feeling you have with the DMT flash is that you have come in through the back door. You know, you somehow have cheated the machinery of mnemonic degradation that keeps us from recalling the dream time, really. And the Australian Aboriginal obsession with the dream time may be uniquely rooted into their well-defined genetic heritage, which is different from everybody else. In other words, this may be something very close to the surface of our accessibility and that the tension within a culture has to do with the tension between itself and its hidden un and its unconscious. I mean, in a way, I'm just recasting Freudian and Jungian perceptions in a kind of new language and saying, you know, the tension in society is caused by the degree to which we are alienated from the unconscious. That's almost a truism. Well, but if through a drug or an exercise, and there are these dream recollection yogas, we could actually overcome that, then we would be as dynamically connected as the aboriginal peoples. Of course, there are those troublesome people who suggest that we may still be dreaming right now, and uh, that the point is to uh, get out of the dream. Well, you mean the possibility that this world is a simulacrum of some sort, that this is actually we're inside a computer or we're inside a bubble in a beer sitting at the end of the bar in a very large bar in a very strange part of the universe. This may be, I mean, I have more and more the thing personally that I struggle with uh, as I live my life is the, the realization or the perception or the delusion. I mean, I'm constantly redefining it, but that I seem to be imprisoned in some kind of work of art, that this is not a life ruled by the laws of probability and statistics, that it's hideously crafted, you know, and there are themes, and it's woven like a rug. It has an intentionality that I find hair-raising and unsettling. This is called, in the parlance of pathology, delusion of reference. It's when you cease to believe that you're nobody and you begin to believe you might be somebody, this is considered proof of uh, severe mental disturbance and you become a candidate for sedation at this point because usually the discovery that you're somebody excites you into a inappropriate states of arousal, which means you interfere with other people being asleep and you run around trying to inform them of the true nature of things, which is that, you know, we're all inside a computer on Vega, or we're all being manipulated by machines in the basement of the CIA, or we're all angels dancing on the head of a pin somewhere, but whatever it is, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, theory in the face of the momentum of simple facts. And then if you persist in this, why, uh, you have a real problem. The only conjuration against that developing into a problem is humor. You have to have a completely uh, jaundiced view of reality. You can't take anything seriously, including 
your own most serious constructs and expectations uh, because it, it is ultimately some kind of a joke. And it is in the DMT thing, you understand this. You are in the realm of those who made the joke. And uh, you're, you're getting close to understanding something that you have the feeling, if it were sufficiently understood and retained, the fiction of ordinary reality as we know it would just dissolve and be seen to have been, you know, as Alice says, well, you're just a pack of cards, you know, something like that. That's a very DMT-like image there, by the way, the folding up into a pack of cards indicates something goes from one dimensional matrix to another, a declining, a declension of dimensionality. You see that often in these hallucinations. They unfold like magic boxes, and then they fold up rather like magic boxes and become quite nothing, yeah. Your image uh, brought forth the vision of the, it would all then be men facing the southeast. Well, yeah, something like that. Or, you know, the peculiar ending of uh, Sin Años de Soledad. I mean, the discovery that the world is a work of art. And, you know, don't forget that scripted into the situation, regardless of whether the rainforest is saved and the ozone hole cured and all that, is your own death. And... uh you know, it will surely be terribly important, at least to you. And so then everything has this quality of being orchestrated and related to this future moment of great existential um, potentiality. How much longer do you think people will die? Will die? How much, when do you think the technological solution will death? Oh, I, d I don't think th that it's a problem, so I don't see that it requires a solution. In other words, trying to avert death would be like caterpillars plotting never to undergo metamorphosis. It just means, you know, you really have a misinformed notion of, of what's going on. I, th I, I was... I never thought I would come to hold these kinds of views because it took me a long time to overcome the teachings of Holy Mother Church, you understand. But nevertheless, it seems to me that it's all tied up in the mystery of, of higher dimensions and that the great teacher of metaphysics, strangely enough, is nature. Nature is the teacher of metaphysics, and you know this cliché, we all learn it in biology, that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. In other words, that the fetus in the womb duplicates the entire evolution of life from amoeba through fish, and you know the bit. Well, but then why then do we halt the metaphor at birth? Obviously, then ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny throughout life. And what that means then is that in as much as we each end in death as individuals, then so probably the entire course of organic existence ends in a kind of closure that is a return to the inorganic. But in this process, something called organic existence has for millions of years clothed itself in the raiment of matter and has carried out this elaborate informational exchange. I mean, matter, as it were, has been invaded by a vitality of some sort that animates it and calls it forth to procreate, build cities, write poetry, compose sonatas. And uh, I just can't believe that this is not the descent into matter of some kind of higher dimensional thing, which, which is not, it doesn't require metaphysics to understand it. It's the hidden dimension of biology 
that if we understood what biology is, then it would be perfectly clear to us what's going on. The reason it's not perfectly clear to us is because we don't understand what life actually is. Uh, we have a notion of how, at the most simple level, proteins are coded out of nucleic acid, but we don't even have a notion of the architecture of the DNA, how the genes are arranged. I mean, someone once said our present state of knowledge about DNA, to believe that that allows you to understand what life is, would be like possessing the telephone directory for Greater Los Angeles and believing that out of that telephone directory you could understand what Los Angeles is. You know, it's absurd. All you have are the phone numbers of the proteins at this point. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, psychedelic trinity that seems useful to me sometimes. Uh, I could tie it in with uh, a film I'd like re to recommend that hasn't been mentioned, the uh, Ralph Abram sort of documentary that you introduced, Chaos Gaia Eros. But uh, the ecstasy, uh, that which is worshipped at the moment of orgasm, one could speak of it as the ancient mother of life forms. The uh, perspective from the clear light, from the hyperspatial platform, from that space totally out of all involvement, out of even the God world involvement, uh, would be the ancient father, uh, the immovable force, uh, the, or the irresistible force, the immovable object, and the working out of these two uh, begets the divine child, and how uh, we can learn to stay in that ecstasy and uh, perhaps even have a garden at the same time, it seems to be it. Well, one of the things we haven't really talked about at all, but that's certainly interesting, uh, is the relationship of psychedelics to sexuality. And then uh, you mention orgasm. I mean, orgasm is a very interesting phenomenon. What's it for? In other words, is this necessary? There are fish that propagate, the female lays the egg and the male swims into the general neighborhood and sheds his sperm into the water. And orgasm is something which intensifies or is present and then intensifies as you ascend the mammalian phylogeny. And it's most present in higher mammals. And, you know, I would like to think that it's most expressed in human beings, but once you watch cats screw, who knows? Uh, but whatever it is, it, it's not necessary for the procreation of life. Well, then what's going on? Because obviously our appetite for or into our society in the form of art and advertising and, and language. It's a very psychedelic thing, and strangely enough, it draws to itself the same kind of anxiety that we see centered around drugs. I mean, if orgasm could be made illegal, they certainly would make it illegal. It's just that it's so hardwired into the organism that short of chastity belts and barbarous things like that, nobody's been able to really get a handle on it. And it is the thing, you know, most like drugs and, ha you know, triggers all these things. You know, you do it in private and nobody should, you know, it's not observed. It's very brief, fleeting, rarely discussed. I mean, whole generations of people have apparently lived and died without being able to confirm its existence even. So... Uh, you said a lot about this in terms of connection with the other, also the need for UFOs, the need to have this other unknown that you want to just get totally into. The felt presence of the other. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we were torn, that we literally, that the mystery of our predicament, I mean, the other night I talked about it in terms of the psilocybin religion on the plains of Africa, and I basically talked about it in mechanical terms. But if you want to talk about it in emotional and psychological terms, 
it isn't the mushroom that we were torn from. It's the trip that we were torn from. And the trip, even among people like ourselves, is rarely enough discussed in detail. I mean, the trip into the Gaian mind was a relationship of symbiosis to a higher organizing intelligence. I mean, it, we call it, you know, these cliches of the New Age, the Earth, our mother, and so forth and so on. It was not a cliché. It was a deeply felt emotional reality. And this is why I say, you know, we are like abused children. We as a civilization, we are the inheritors of a dysfunctional situation based on abuse. We were torn from the breast too soon, ripped from the womb, never to know our birthright and our parentage because instead we were plunged into the hell world of history. And it's made us pathological, made us unable to survive without the satisfaction of making war upon each other, gaining dominance over each other. The most pathological among us have proven the most adaptable in the uh, situation of abuse and trauma called history. And the consequences were hidden for a while, for a few thousand years. But science has set loose processes now where we have to pay the piper. Turns out there is a price to be paid for this kind of, of narcissistic, self-destructive, unconscious, repetitious behavior. And so now certain segments of the human community are attempting to slam on the brakes. And some people think, you know, that you should join the Moonies or something. Other people say, no, psychedelic drugs. Other people say Buddhism. Somebody else says vegetarianism, something else. But there's a frantic search now to find answers because the, the, the lethal nature of business as usual has been recognized in some quarters. And I would predict that as problems deepen, as the contradictions become more intense, the desperation will spread, and eventually all answers will be looked at. Everybody who thinks they have a clue will be invited forward to have their three minutes at court to try and explain, because the planetary social and economic and ecological systems are beginning to shimmy and and buck as the shock wave of eschatology builds up on the tra on the leading edges of our civilization i mean we're just like trying to push an airfoil past the speed of sound if the airfoil is not designed correctly it will eventually just break to pieces and explode if, on the other hand, it has the correct aerodynamic, then the pressure will build and build and build. It's called Q in engineering terms. The Q will accumulate on all the leading surfaces, and then there'll come a moment of truth, and you're through, and it's smooth sailing, and you're through the cultural barrier or the ecological barrier. So what we're trying to do here is a rather tall order. We're redesigning the cultural airfoil in flight because we're in flight. We have been for centuries, and now we have to change the flight configuration or, or we're going, it'll be like running into a concrete wall at 1,000 miles an hour. So how does that relate to the orgasm? Well, the orgasm, I think, is some kind of a compass an interior cultural compass showing us where we want to go. Uh, somebody mentioned Ralph's book, Chaos, Gaia, Eros. Eros is the one that informs. I mean, Chaos is the abstracting metaphor, and Gaia is the planetary context. But Eros is the, the impelling... Force the you know it would 
play the role of the Holy Ghost in an Orthodox Christian trinity. Uh, our drive to complexify, our drive to create art, to symbolic activity, so forth and so on, is probably all rooted in our sexuality. And the incredible synergistic effect that psychedelics have on sexuality seems to imply that, you know, I guess, was it Tim Leary? Somebody said years ago, you know, the most erogenous zone of your body is your brain. I mean, this is certainly true. I mean, sex is largely 90% probably an activity of the human imagination. And primates are highly sexed. I mean, our sexuality is suppressed, but this has partly to do with the rise of patriarchy and the need to control women in that situation. Our nearest genetic relatives, the pygmy chimpanzees, the bonubo, are the most sexually outrageous creatures in all of nature. I mean, their behavior is, uh, you know would shame the Mitchell brothers, and they just carry on constantly like this. I mean, heterosexual, homosexual, group growth, this and that, everything you can imagine. Uh, and how they were able to do that in a situation where vi opportunistic viruses were strolling around, I don't know. But I think it is our natural inclination to be what Freud called polymorphically perverse meaning basically if it feels good we're willing to do it unless cultural mechanisms of some sort have been put in place and of course our culture is the most sexually anxious human culture presently in existence I mean maybe there have been more uptight cultures in the past but certainly presently existing I think we're toward the top of the heap we grow very anxious when there's boundary dissolution. And it comes through orgasm. This is why the French call orgasm the little death. And it comes through psychedelics. And, you know, the male anxiety about maintaining erection and performance and all of this, all of this has to do with boundary maintenance. And, and uh, we're paradoxically set against ourselves. It's the root of most sexual neurosis. And, you know, Freud, whatever you think of the whole ball of wax, certainly did have an insight when he saw that civilization was a circumstance consequent upon sexually neurotic and repressed behavior. Sex and drugs and rock and roll, I mean, these things seem to be pretty intimately linked. In other words, acoustical driving, sexual license, and pharmacological disruption of ordinary brain states. This is what religion was about for the first couple of million years. And then, you know, beady-eyed eunuchs got a hold of it. Weasels. I mean, people you wouldn't leave alone with your chickens took charge. <laughs> and have been in charge ever since. So, Eunuchs is part of the word, though. Terrence? <laughs> the, uh, the concept of sex, drug, and rock, and rock and roll is always communal. It's always us. It's not solitary. And it seems like the technological revolution is lots of solitary efforts, sitting at a computer screen, sitting at home watching TV, uh, putting earphones on with your Walkman. All that stuff seems to be more of the great barrier to life. Well, it's a barrier to physical community, but some people might argue, you know, that a virtual community is coming into existence. Uh, I'm not that keen to make that point. Uh, I do think that any, any activity that you can participate in that does not involve matter is a good thing. So it's better to access the well than to drive 60 miles to see a friend. Uh, but I'm not an enthusiast of teledildonics and some of the more exotic technological se sexual schemes that have been cooked up. The electronic network, the ultimate 
uh, effect of all this electronic technology, I think, is to encourage diversity. I think that, you know, this is a favorite beef of mine, but I, I think that it profits people to go back and read Marshall McLuhan, that McLuhan was never assimilated. He was simply dismissed. At the same time that psychedelic drugs were suppressed, McLuhan ceased to be ever mentioned in the academy, and that he very, very brilliantly explained the impact of media on cultural dynamics. And by media, we mean any technology, from the screwdriver to LSD, uh, technologies change the societies that use them always in ways that the society cannot anticipate and expect. And so I think computers are really driving a lot of this archaic tribalism. I mean, obviously, in a world with epidemics, socially transmitted and sexually transmitted diseases and stuff like that, we can't return to the simple orgy around the campfire of 20,000 years ago. And yet we need to do something operationally equivalent to that. Well, the electronic media may throw open an opportunity for that. I don't know. I don't pretend to understand it. I mean, like, for instance, my normal reaction to gratuitous violence in media is to deplore it like everybody else does. On the other hand, I've never had to bash somebody's brains out in fury, and it may be because I've seen a lot of that done for me on celluloid, and so it has in some sense depotentiated the need for violence. In other words, maybe vicarious violence is, is the is as de-violent as we can be. It, you know, the primatologists talk about, um, this goes back to the sexual thing again, chimpanzees that never witness other chimpanzees having sex never get it together. They masturbate their way through life. Male chimpanzees that have never seen the sex act can't get it together. Well, so then... What do we do? We inveigh against pornography, stigmatize it, and it has to be hidden away. And yet, you know, probably the consequence of so much uh, soft core and harder core pornography on cable television is probably a measurable increase in the amount of pleasure and non neurotic sex that people are having because they finally saw what was permitted, you know, or got an idea of what was permitted, and said, my God, you can do that, and you can do that, and you can do that, well, let's get to it. On the other hand, it may be like violence, if people see so much of it, and it looks so good there, they may feel like they don't have to do it as much, or gee, when I do it, it's not as good, I'll just watch it. Well, like I say, I don't, I don't feel strongly about these things. I think they're interesting questions, uh, how media affects us and what's good and what's bad. Everything is very double-edged, you know. I mean, take a concept like uh, free trade. Sounds good. Free trade is a license for cultural murder and genocide. Free trade means I can sell crap anywhere. It means, you know, farewell rug makers of Tajikistan, pottery makers of the upper Amazon, crapola is headed your way and don't try to stop it. Everything, ha you know, you can't figure out, until you figure out what goals you're trying to maximize, you don't know whether you want more violence in the movies or less violence in the movies or more sex on cable TV or less or, or what you're trying to do. I believe firmly in, in the power of the imagination and in the wisdom of the situation. Thank God. I mean, imagine how despairing one would be if they believed that uh, the solution to our problems rested in highly trained executives implementing the correct policies. I mean, my God, it means we're up shit creek without a paddle. But 
what the psychedelics reveal is a dynamic on a scale where, and they just basically say, do not worry, act, commit, but don't radiate anxiety because it's just ridiculous uh, to radiate anxiety. It vitiates energy and some kind of plan is happening. Every situation that has been put in place on this planet from the very beginning has been eventually swapped out for something else. And you know, we worry about the impact of human civilization, but uh, an asteroid smashing down on this planet in a fraction of a second could do more damage by orders of magnitude than 50,000 years of human technology and pollution. So uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting to try and build an ethic or a point of view when you expand your premises to try and actually encompass the, the real dynamic of the planetary and cosmic environment which is unpredictable, shifting, willful, and uh, beyond rational apprehension, largely, I think. Yeah. Well, it could be. I mean, it's a fine line, for instance. I mean, I heard somebody recently on a talk show say, you know, if you're going to ban books which promote psychotic violence, and they were talking about some one of these horrific slasher things and people wanted to ban, said if you're going to ban books which, which promote psychotic violence, the Bible has promoted more psychotic violence than any other book in history. By I mean, immediately you jump on that sucker. On the other hand, Carolyn and I were talking the other day, and it's not exactly violence, but we, we learned our psychedelic, we got our psychedelic muscles working by reading H.P. Lovecraft, which introduces you, you know, to... The con how to tolerate bad trips, yeah. basically. Yeah. Ideas so horrifying <laughs> that, you know, you just, oh my God, you know, what is this? And I heard recently, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that the woman he lived with for many years who ran him quite uh, around the block had been lovers with Aleister Crowley immediately before she went to Lovecraft. But I don't vouch for that. It could have just been someone's... Uh, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a spurious tale to me. But science fiction, it, for me, was my, as Carolyn said, my entry drug. I mean, before I got to pot, before I got... Science fiction did it. And, you know, certain writers were stronger drugs than others. I mean, you must read Olaf Stapleton's The Star Maker. You must read A.E. Van Vaux's The Weapon Shops of Ishtar. You must read 
Philip K. Dick, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, Brian Aldiss's The Long Afternoon of Earth, War, uh, Walter F. Miller's A Canticle for Leibowitz. Uh, I mean, these things stretch your imagination, and then you begin to think, well, you know, alien life forms, things that come and get you in your dreams, magic which works, uh, and, 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 and the wonderful thing about science fiction is it's often worked out in the context of characters that are attempting to use rational analysis to come to terms with these things, you know. Do, uh, Mr. Spock being the paradigmatic figure. I mean, Mr. Spock is the kind of person you'd want to turn on to DMT because he could just say, well, Jim, uh, uh, <laughs> fascinating, uh, appears to affect the Alpha One logical modules and the, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, it's... It's a, it's a funny thing. I mean, the bizarre, the outre, I think, I, like, I don't, for instance, like Stephen King and that kind of thing. My stuff has to be a little more Baroque and a little more artsy than that. But I am interested in the weird. And the weird is not all fuzzy and cuddly. I mean, you know, you got your Giegers out there and your Marquis de Sades and all that, although I read some of that recently and it's more silly than I would have thought. Uh, Catholicism is just such a strange thing. There's an amazing scene in, in the, bed, the philosophers of the boudoir where this woman is assaulting her nephew while having homosexual sex with her sister-in-law while hanging a goat while doing something else and in the center of this incredible scene of multiple perversity she looks up from her work and points out to the abbey with the whip raised above her she says and I am being a bad example <laughs> Which is just the, you know, the icing on the cake. If you are not a bad example, what's the point, you know? <laughs> yeah. In, a, in, in the work that I've done with Michael Horner and some others in Shalonic, one of the things that, that is often stressed is the, is the crucial importance of the intention, mm -hmm. the, the answers that you get sense come because of the intention you have when you start. In, in your work with psychedelics, does that seem to be an important thing? Do you, do you work with that much, or is it more just, I'm going to go and see what happens? No, I'm more a phenomenologist. I just say to it, I say, you know, please don't hurt me, and I'm yours. Thy will be done, whatever it is. I'm not leading anybody anywhere, and I'm not saying what it is, uh, and I don't know what it is. I'm, my approach is basically scientific, and I say, here's something weird that we found in the woods. Uh, what is it? And it, it look, you know, it has adumbrations spiritual, adumbrations biological, adumbrations mathematical, adumbrations aesthetic, and so forth and so on. But I don't know what it is. All I know is it's the most interesting thing around. I, I once asked the mushroom why it had unloaded so much of its intentionality on myself and my brother the old why me question and it's it answered without hesitation it said because you don't believe anything because you don't believe anything you have no barrier to knowledge yeah you have no expectation you're not going to proclaim it, that it's the virgin mary or the muse or people from the pleiades or anything you say hell i haven't a clue I don't know what it is. It, it clearly is something which partakes of ourselves. In other words, 
a freaky thing about it is that as you approach it, it becomes more and more like a doppelganger. It clothes itself in you. And so as you, when you finally are able to take it by its hand, you're just having a conversation with yourself. But then as you pull back, this otherness flows into it again. And the, some of the strangest trips I've had are the ones where at some point in the dialogue I will say to the thing, show me what you are for yourself. And it's like suddenly the cheerful trip about the end of the world and the time wave, or whatever it is, just halts. And it's like that enormous organ tone at the beginning of the Bach B minor mass, you know? And it's like, and the curtains begin to rise, and I just begin to feel like I'm shrinking, and it's rising up, and it says, you know, you want to see the naked radiance of the unspeakable? Behold, O oh insect! And you say, oh God, you know, okay, good, let's, enough of that, back to the show, please. And so, and I, a friend of mine says, every time he takes mushrooms, he says his goal, the goal of the trip, as he puts it, is to stand more. To stand more. Because as it begins to part the veil, at some point, you know, you cry uncle. But to the degree that you can persist and tolerate its iskite, its beingness in and of itself, then that's the real basis for knowledge. But I really believe this thing that J.B.S. Haldane said, you know, the world is not only stranger than we suppose, it's stranger than we can suppose. So that's a lot of permission for supposing there. I suppose that if your, if your use of these plants was for the purpose of healing people in you, then that would change the way that you would probably approach them. Mm -hmm. that's not the way you use them, so No, I've never claimed to be a shaman, and when people lay that on me, what I say is, no, you know, that's preposterous. I'm a shamanologist. I'm interested in the phenomenon of shamanism, but to presume to cure somebody, I mean, I can't imagine. No, I'm in the Whiteheadian tradition actually an older tradition than that. You know, Francis Bacon, who I often say ugly things about because he had the wrong attitude toward nature, he said, of, Francis Bacon said of nature, let us place her on the rack of rational inspection that we may wring from her her secrets. That was Fran But he also said, uh, he said, in the absence of a theory, simply collect facts. And that's where we're at with this psychedelic thing. We have no theory. Psychology is in its infancy. No psychology, no theory of human psychic functioning need be taken seriously at all. From neuro-linguistic programmers to Jungians to Freudians to Adlerians to they all, one-third gets better, one-third get worse, one-third stay the same. These psychologies are no better than, you know, burning green candles and this sort of thing. So uh, we don't have a science of, hu of human psychology. What we have then is the Baconian dilemma. We should simply collect facts. That's why I put so much stress in t the groups that I talk to, to talking about the experience. This is what's really important. I mean, to, and you know, pharmacology texts don't do that. I mean, they say compound F created LSD like hallucinations, hypnagogia, delusion of reference, period. Well, this delusion of reference was for somebody. 
a life-changing struggle with some kind of god or demon. We want to hear more about this delusion of reference. What was the delusion of reference? And what was the resolution of this delusion? So forth and so on. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the details. Blake said, attend the minute particulars that we can then build up some kind of picture of what this is. I have the strong intuition that it's historically important, that it's always been around, it is the basis of, a, of an ancient, ancient religion, the world's oldest religion, uh, but it's going to have some kind of impact on our dilemma. We may, as a global culture, be sinking ever deeper and faster into the quicksand, but we are not sinking into the quicksand in a state of entire unconsciousness. Some people actually realize the depth of our dilemma. So that means that this isn't a, an absurd situation where the fool is crushed in the rock slide and never knows what struck. It's a tragedy because there is the possibility of making a stand against the forces of extinction. There is a possibility of overcoming the dilemma and yet whether or not we exercise and realize that possibility has, it seems to me, something to do with how fast the word is gotten out about the bankruptcy of the paradigm of rational materialism and positivism and so forth and so on. And the evidence is all around us. I mean, people believe it's so exotic that I basically prophesy the end of the world like somebody in a New Yorker cartoon. Well, but I've got news for you. The straightest people around prophesy the end of the world. They can see it coming. It's just for them it means the end of the petroleum, the end of any place to put the atomic power plant waste, uh, the end of sexuality as we know it, so forth and so on. But the end of the world is on everybody's dance card. And you can have a psychedelic transcendental version of it, like I'm trying to put out, or you can have a Bosnia-Herzegovina version of it, which is where untrammeled rationalism and didactic scheming by politicians is going to take us. Just more ranting and raving. Anybody want to say anything? Yeah, What's, Karen. One of, the, one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is trying to figure out a way to start a syncretic religion assist in this, in this task of, of uh, replacing uh, organized journalistic religion with a more sympathetic, uh, uh, sort of pantheistic, earth-based, uh, psychedelic Dionysian leaping around sort of thing that would be that we could get to, to make, to develop it, to just to start to develop something like that. They give it a, give it a, a position in, in our lives and begin to spread it as a as a as a new as a new way to deal with uh, with life issues, and uh, I'd like to, if I could get Terence to comment on, on an idea or two for starting something. A syncre a new <coughs> syncretic religion. Yes. Well, you could just say, <laughs> "Fat man, give me that guitar." <laughs> <laughs> Sure. <laughs> I'll do the plucking from here on. <laughs> no, I, I, well, I guess my best shot is, is the mushroom. And the reason really that Dennis and I published that book in the mid-70s was because I felt that if the mushroom were accessible, all else would follow. And in a sense it has, and in a sense it hasn't. I mean, more people should grow that mushroom because it is the ur, you know, in my pantheon, it's the ur substance. It is, of all the allies, the one that was with us on the long march across the grasslands and into Eden and out of Eden and so forth and so on. And it is also just totally bizarre 
that the mushroom speaks. I mean, even in the realm of psychedelics, this is extraordinary. Others, occasionally, you can go a squawk or two out of them. But the mushroom just rants and raves. You can't shut it up, you know? It won't take no for an answer. So I think bringing these cults of, of communal activity, communal intoxication, use of music, sexuality, sound, and psychedelics to break down social boundaries, to empower underclasses, uh, and push it forward, that this is the best we can do, and you can just sort of choose where you want to be. Salvia has a, it, you know, it has a potential. Uh, MDMA drawbacks and potential. Uh, psilocybin I like just because I think it appeals to the wiggier side of my personality. It also is an item of commerce. You know, it's rescued many a family from going on the welfare rolls and <laughs> given them a life of honest toil in, in replacement to um, something else. Cannabis, Cannabis as well. And uh, it fascinates me, you know, I believe that the issue around legalization is deeper than we all think in that there, the reason that these drugs, which do not promote criminal syndicalism and do not, you know, we don't see people twitching in the gutters because of psilocybin or cannabis, the reason these things are so savagely suppressed is because consciously or unconsciously, the truth of my insight is sensed in the establishment, the insight that these things dissolve boundaries and are therefore psychosocial dynamite. And no, no society, I don't care whether it's run by Hasidic Jews or stockbrokers or Marxists or whoever it is, no society is going to unleash a substance or a practice that causes people to question the premises upon which the government is based. In that sense, these psychedelics are profoundly antisocial in all times and all places. If you've got more of a society together than a bunch of people herding cattle around and having sex together at the new and full moon, then it's going to be eroded and it's going to be called into question by these things. That's why, you know, I wish that we could trick them, basically, trick them into legalizing cannabis. Because I think removing that one tiny chink from the dike will let the oceans of noetic uh, intentionality flow in and they'll be, it'll be to their eyebrows before they ever knew what hit them. And, but apparently they know this full well, and they're not going to be talked into legalizing weed on some lame argument about tax revenue or something like that when they realize that the whole society will disappear. The CIA chemist, Sidney Cohen, who did their dirty work for them for years, made an amazing statement in, like, 1965. He said, we must suppress LSD. He said, if the potential for LSD were ever understood by the public at large, our society would disappear overnight. You know, this was the CIA master chemist. He knew whereof he spoke. And that's why these things are so politically sensitive, because these are the pheromones that carry the central core messages of the assembly language that is holding Western civilization together. Right now, that message is hard work, monogamy, fidelity to capitalist values, and a maxed out credit card. And, a maxed out credit card. <laughs> and then, and right. you know, and if you said no, no, you know, you don't need all this junk. And monogamy is a pain in the neck, and think about X, Y, and Z, like this and this and this. And they would say, oh my God, you know, what are you doing? What are you proposing? What kind of madness is this? Well, it's the kind of madness we've lived too long without, you see. And, 
and so I think it's basically a struggle over social values, not easily won. There's some uh, uh, amazing uh, acid heads uh, of long survival to, to do all of the above that you mentioned, uh, you know, including the maxed out. Oh, you mean that have hard, sold out? And work hard every day and uh, uh, are still uh, wild psychedelic acid heads. Uh, one in particular uh, used to uh, get high or smoke grass before uh, high-powered business meetings with all the Japanese executives uh, and made vast fortunes. Well, I've, I have never, I mean, this is heresy, I know, but I have never embraced LSD as the answer. I think you're probably right, but I dare say I doubt there are too many psilocybin heads in that situation. You might be able to find one, sort of the Willie Hogan of, of psilocybinania, but uh, I, I think that... Statistically speaking, I don't think the argument stands up. I mean, when you're dealing with human populations, you're going... I mean, there were people who used to, after a busy day of incinerating Jews, would go home and put their feet up and listen to box choral preludes with full appreciation of them. Still, this is not a judgment on Bach, uh, I think. So... I think, generally speaking, psychedelics impel people toward a saner uh, lifestyle. But the reason I prefer the plants is because I believe in the morphogenetic depth of the field that must surround a, a shamanic hallucinogen that's been used for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. Do you personally like San Pedro, and why don't you have more to say about it, uh, especially being so ancient and all? Uh, I'm not, I've never been very keen, I think it's just a personal thing, I've never been a very keen person on mescaline in any form. It is the one of these psych mainstream big psychedelics with a history of shamanic usage that's it's an amphetamine not an indole and i seem just to do better with the indoles i this very small category dmt lsd uh the beta carbolines the uh ibogaine complex the only exception that i feel personally impelled to to make to sticking with that family is I'm tremendously partial to cannabis, which is a polyhydric alcohol. But I'm certainly willing to grant that San Pedro and mescaline, these are venerable chemicals, and mescaline was the first psychedelic to receive any amount of study. The use of peyote is not millennia old. People who imagine that it's been used for thousands and thousands of years, it hasn't. There's no evidence for that. What's found in the old graves in the peyote cultural area are the seeds of Sephora secundifolia, which is a, a hideously an ordeal plant, a toxin. The San Pedro complex in Peru, on the other hand, looks to be as old as any datable plant cult on the planet. So uh, that's probably just a preference of of mine. In a way, though, I I do it because you know there are thousands of altered states of all kinds, ranging from biliousness through the whole gamut of opiated states, all the tropane states, the dis, what do they call them, the, uh, the ketamine states, the states of analgesia, and so forth and so on, states of hyperthermia, dream states, states of panic. But the psyched, this indole family seems to me the most non-invasive. Also, the other thing I would say about mescaline that's pretty, that's beyond argument, is one way to judge a compound's toxicity is by how much you have to take to get off. And a real good hit of mescaline is 700 milligrams. That's a shitload of pure alkaloid. Um, you know, psilocybin, 30 milligrams. 
5 meo dmt 15 dmt King 700 milligrams of, of a pure alkaloid is a little daunting, although, you know, this wonderful needlepoint mescaline that some people made a few years ago definitely is welcome in my stash any time. Yeah, Carolyn. I heard you mention pheromones a minute ago, and that, because one of the questions that I've been asking people that's come to my mind is, you know, why is it that LSD is so much more powerful? quantitatively than all the other so-called psychedelics. In other words, the amount that you take that, that totally changes your life is infinitesimal. You really can't really see it with the naked eye. Barely. And uh, perhaps it is a pheromone. Perhaps it is something that, that, that unlocks uh, behavior uh, rather than actually affects any chemistry anywhere. It's unlocking the behavior. Well, I think this is a very interesting idea. Years and years ago, I studied tropical botany and geography from a guy in San Francisco named Ralph Aidy. And he, I don't know where this guy was coming from, but he gave a lecture on the subject of hallucinogens as pheromones and had this concept all worked out circa 1973 that hallucinogens were what he called exopheromones. You see, a pheromone is usually a chemical released within the context of a species to regulate the individuals within that species, like in an anthill. He said, we need a new word. The word should be exopheromone. And an exopheromone is a compound which carries information from one species to another. And, in fact, this is the experience that we have on psilocybin. It's just that we can't believe that information could be so explicitly uh, conveyed. But if this were true, it would be a very good way of regulating behavior. Uh, if you release uh, just a few milligrams of moth pheromone, you can release moths up to 15 miles away who will immediately orient toward your pheromonal source and head toward it. Well, my God, the sensitivity of their olfactory system must be down to the level of picking up a few atoms, a few molecules of this stuff. Uh, somebody said recently, if you want a picture of how powerful the activity of LSD is, Imagine a single red ant ripping down the World Trade Center in a half an hour and you have a picture of how effective LSD is at undoing uh, the mammalian organism. I mean, it is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, we just don't know of drugs. In fact, I, probably only pheromones work at that, at that level of concentration. Okay, gang, I think we better break this up. Thank you.